Hey all, let's jump right back into it. Again, broad liminal space. There may or may not have been a time passage for you, but if there was, I appreciate it. Today I'm going to be chatting about Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. This was actually the book I was reading when my slump started and it had nothing to do with the book because I was loving it. So I also had to sit with it a second after I actually finished it and kind of absorb. And so I'm sure there will be things that I miss within the text, both from having read it over a kind of longer period of time. I fully expected to finish it the weekend I started it. If you look at it, it's very short. The pagination, the topography, like the way everything is spaced out, we're not fitting tons and tons of text on a page. So I had every expectation of finishing quickly. And life had other expectations for me, but that's okay because it was nice to kind of sit with this language and kind of languish in it. I know languish is a word that I kind of come back to again and again, but that's how it kind of feels. And so before I dive into the book itself, I do want to give a couple caveats. The first is that while I'm going to try and stay away from major spoilers for this book, I don't know how to talk about this book without there being spoilers on some level because things are so intricately tied together. So just please be very aware that if you haven't read the book yet and are planning to and kind of want that element of surprise and delight in the way things unfold, that you might just want to save this for later. Additionally, I am unable to kind of come to this book, this text, without thinking of some of the other books this year that have also kind of grappled with similar themes or structures. And those particularly from my reading experience are To Paradise and How High We Go in the Dark. Thematically across the board a little bit and in terms of form with To Paradise to a certain extent in the sense of different timelines that we're kind of jumping to. So the book itself, this book, Sea of Tranquility, starts with us following Edwin, who is a kind of younger son of gentry, aristocracy, and he is being shunned to the wilderness of Canada because he has said something at a dinner that upset his parents, and he's just being kind of cast out from society for this misstep by his family. And so we get the sense of great space within the novel. And it's very interesting the way that language functions in here, because as I showed you in terms of language and the way it's laid out on the page, it's not dense in the sense that it doesn't look dense. There's not tons of text. It doesn't, you know, go on and on. Neither is it staccato. It is a kind of perfect medium that leaves a lot of room for reflection, which I think is a hallmark of Emily St. John Mandel's work to a large extent. And the way that she is able to craft emotion and a sense of space, both in terms of creating an atmosphere and a physical place, but very specifically an emotional place. Like sure, tone, but there is a great emotional depth to this. There is a loneliness. There is a sense of expanse to the language. And I think it's very interesting, especially when I consider it against these other works that are for better or for worse, kind of pandemic novels. How High We Go in the Dark did not come out of the current moment, but it still kind of grapples with similar things. To Paradise is kind of grappling with a lot of that. And this does it in much different ways. And it's also very interesting to read a pandemic novel from a writer whose biggest hit is a pandemic novel and a novel that was part of the zeitgeist, so to speak, throughout in terms of the literary community, I would argue. It was something that readers that had read Station Eleven kind of looked to and thought about, or at least I know I did, and then of course we've had the show. And so both paint much different pictures. In Station Eleven, and granted it's been a second since I did a full reread, there is a sense of isolation and desolation, but there's also a great sense of community. So I'll get to, because the pandemic part of this doesn't start right away. So we have, you know, this wastrel of a son. And, you know, he doesn't do great. He's not someone that, when thrust out onto his own, suddenly finds purpose right away. And so he ends up in kind of the wilderness of Canada. And then he ends up in the woods one day, and something 
weird happens. And that weird thing is the kind of impetus for everything else. And even though that's our kind of inciting incident thematically, we have a kind of languid lead up to it and it doesn't feel like we're rushing anywhere. Neither is it a very prolonged lead up though. So like I said, she makes great use of space. She covers a lot of narrative distance and emotional distance within that narrative in a little bit of room. And then we move on to the second section, which had me frantically messaging one of my friends who lives cross country, who I knew was also excited for this book. And I was like, did she really just do that? And she did. She manages to weave in without any spoilers or any loss, I think, of narrative if you haven't read it, but she weaves in The Glass Hotel, which was her most recent book. And so we kind of catch up with one of the sideline characters or secondary characters, I should say, of The Glass Hotel and one of our more forward characters as well. And it is woven in to here. And it starts with this kind of odd event that mirrors the odd event that we'd seen from Edwin's narrative, his point of view. And it immediately places us with the composer character, if you know who I'm talking about, from Glass Hotel. And I thought that that was just so well done, really spectacular. And also had me messaging him because he said he'd finished the book. And I was like, do I need to reread Station Eleven? Are there going to be deeper cut references in here that I may miss? And he was like, no. But the next section, I would argue, touches on Station Eleven a little bit because it is about an author on a book tour further into the future. So we have, you know, the past past, the relatively recent past, and then we're going into near-ish future. And Olive, our character, is on a book tour, and there is a pandemic that's kind of breaking out on the periphery as her book is about a pandemic. So it's very interesting because it probably feels the most autobiographical of the book. I'm not here to say whether it is or not, but it was very interesting and it was very interesting knowing, you know, the layers. Station Eleven was a pandemic novel that was facing a lot of resurgence amidst a pandemic, also like the conversation around it, the conversation around it and the show and how that, you know, came back a little bit. I don't think there's been as much conversation as I was anticipating or hoping, but I also still need to watch it. So I don't get to say anything about that, but it, it's just a very interesting little angle. And amidst all of these narratives, there's this through line and there's this little bit of odd. And one of the through lines of each narrative is a character that kind of shows up on the periphery and just feels out of place in whatever way. So in the first timeline, there is a priest that shows up in the woods that Edwin hadn't had any contact with before within this small, like close-knit community. In the second section, there's just a guy, like another fan of this composer that just has a lot of questions. And Mirella, our eyes in that portion, is like, I think I've seen this guy before. And then in Olive's point of view or her narrative, we have this reporter. And then we go to the far, far future and we meet Gaspery, and he has grown up on a colony without light, and we find out some things about him as well that connect him to these other narratives in some way. Like, for instance, a smaller piece is that he grew up in the same place that Olive grew up, but when she was there, it was a kind of normal community, and by the time he's growing up, it's fully dark. And so then things kind of continue and we stay with Gaspery the rest of the narrative, but we do get peeks back into our other characters. So hopefully that's not too spoilery. I apologize if it is. I will say the first section or two, I was expecting it to go one way and it went a different way narratively in terms of how all of these narratives thread together. And I wasn't displeased with it because it's a device that I really, really enjoy, but I'm not sure if it all together ties together at the end. Like I see what it was doing, but I'm not sure about 
how it actually executes all the way through. And in some ways it was interesting because it felt a little bit like the bone clocks, if you read the bone clocks, and particularly the bone clocks and not Slade House. Because one thing I find really intriguing and engaging about the bone clocks is that we have all of these kind of narratives sprinkled throughout that we know are kind of loosely tied together in some way. And it has been a while since I read The Bone Clocks because I read it when it came out and I'm not going to think about how long ago that was. And yet with The Bone Clocks, it always feels like there's something really interesting and odd happening on the periphery. And you as a reader, or at least I as a reader, because I can speak for no one else, was like, but I really want to see what's going on stage left. Like what's going on over there? Because I know it's cool and I want to see it. But at the same time, you have this really fully realized narrative at the forefront at center stage and you know that it's fully realized but you also know that there's something really interesting going on off to the side and you just can't reach it and it's one of those examples of how even when you can't see everything when an author has really fully thought about a thing it's evident in the narrative because we can feel the thing going on on the sidelines and we want a piece of that action that being said the way like i said with the resolution I don't know if it all wrapped up perfectly. It's also something and a device that's really hard to wrap up. And I'm not necessarily saying it needs to be wrapped up. It needs to have a bow, but it feels like the narrative did want to accomplish that. It did try to put a bow on it in a way that almost took away a little bit for me because it felt like the narrative was really grappling with these ideas of individualism and community amidst tragedy or amidst upheaval. It was grappling with these ideas of loneliness and space. And we see that in the language itself. And the themes were big, but they weren't beat over the head. There's a lot of nuance, I think, there. And a lot of the book feels very still. I will say like some of Olive's parts I thought might have gone on a little bit too long. That being said, I think they were the closest to the author narratively. So they were the easiest to kind of access those emotions and that emotional truth within those sections. And one thing within that section, because that I think kind of rooted and it was like the fulcrum point for the thematic ideas of the book, especially since Olive was touring a book about a pandemic. And so she got a lot of questions about that. And then we saw kind of like the expanse on either side and it doesn't really grapple with it too closely too on the nose or too heavily in the same way that we get with the last section of two paradise where it goes really dystopia there are elements of dystopia i would say in the future like you have a whole colony without light and there was one quote that i marked i've got it on my computer so i will read it from there again the language in here was just gorgeous but i didn't write a whole lot down but they were asking, they being like people in the novel, or Olive was pondering why books, stories, narratives about things like pandemics, about disasters, why they resonate so much. And the quote is, someone suggested to me that it has to do with a secret longing for heroism, which I found interesting. Perhaps we believe on some level that if the world were to end and be remade, if some unthinkable catastrophe were to occur, then perhaps we might be remade too perhaps into better, more heroic, more honorable people. And it's not, you know, revolutionary. And it's just a hair close to two on the nose. But it also really resonated with me because it got to this truth of, I think something I had been waiting for throughout the past couple of years is I was waiting for some greater heroism, greater moment of truth or strength or rebuilding to come from the chaos. There is a sense of wanting order from the chaos and we're not always going to get order from the chaos. In fact, most of the time we won't get that order. And I think this novel attempts to give a little bit of order to that chaos, which I think is part of of what took away from the ending for me a little bit because it felt like a little bit too tight of a bow even as there was an attempt to leave it a little bit more open-ended and I don't think everything was wrapped up by any means because again for most of the time we're looking at kind of these lush fragments and I think one of the reasons this worked for me so much better than Two Paradise did 
even though they were both following different kind of timelines, different stories, is that we didn't linger. I mean, I talked about how he maybe stayed on Olive a little too long for my taste, but again, that's just my taste. And also, to me, as a reader, again, always subjective, To Paradise felt a little gratuitous to me. We just went on and it didn't feel like we were always building. It felt like there was an opportunity to tighten that we just didn't take. And that's always a prerogative, and I know lots and lots of readers that it worked for. And here, it was a much tighter thing. So even when it felt like we were ambling, it also felt like there was a purpose to that detour. And there was a greater emotional thematic journey that we were on. Also, I just really love the writing style. But ultimately, this really lived up to my expectations of a new Emily St. John Mandel novel while being completely different, I think, than what I was expecting. I don't know that I expected her to engage thematically with anything about a pandemic again, or at least this close to an actual one, especially because of the popularity and success of Station Eleven. But I think that she managed to weave in her last two major works in a really interesting way because we saw that thematic resurgence of Station Eleven with all of, we saw direct cameos from characters in the Glass Hotel and it just really worked. Ultimately, I, I don't know, I think I would place this in the middle between Glass Hotel and Station Eleven for me. I think for me, in terms of which works I like best, and again, subjective, because I like them all, I would say Station Eleven, Sea of Tranquility, Glass Hotel. I really enjoyed Glass Hotel, but my favorite parts were the Ponzi scheme parts, and we didn't get to stick with those very long. But I really liked how it wrapped things or gave us a little bit more closure on some things from Glass Hotel so that we got to end on a really resonant emotional beat in that book. But here we got a little bit more and nothing that like overshadowed anything happening in this narrative, nothing that ruins that emotional beat, that emotional ending of the glass hotel or feels too neat and clean, but also is just like, uh huh. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. But again, doesn't undermine anything from any of the narratives. So I really enjoyed this. I did admittedly have to sit with it a lot longer than I was anticipating, but that's not the book's fault. That's just my brain. So if you read this, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts because it's been out for a second now. And either way, thanks for hanging out. Read something good. And yeah.